first service that there's a reason scripture tells us clap your hands all you people because sometimes it changes the atmosphere I'll, also, I'll say it it changes the atmosphere and it changes us when we do something physical sometimes when we do something physical it breaks something in our spiritual life and sometimes when we have a breakthrough in our spiritual life we act different physically amen and so joy is not circumstantial and the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so, yes, that's right. So what I want us to do, I want us to sing this again. And we're just going to clap and we're going to change the atmosphere. Sometimes we got to step out of what we're in. Do you know what I mean? So if you're walking through something right now, let this be your moment where you step out of that and into the joy of the Lord. Here we go.
You know, sometimes it's a choice to build your life on the rock instead of sand. It's always a choice, but sometimes it's a hard choice. Sometimes we have to act in faith and choose to put our lives in his hands. I want us to sing this bridge again. And I want us to take every area of our life that we might be holding back from him or afraid to let him speak into or heal or reign over that part of our heart. And I want us to choose to trust him this morning. as a prayer this morning. It's better to give than to receive as we enter the Advent season of waiting, figuratively waiting for your arrival and celebrating you breaking into our world in a special way in the form of a baby to bridge the divide, to, to heal the gap, the space between us. God, we sing out to you this morning songs that remind us of the meaning of Christmas. We're going to sing some new songs, maybe some old ones this morning too. Just follow along when you can.
we thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you for all that means to us, for salvation, for the promise of the presence of your spirit. We love you this morning. We pray that you would change our hearts today by something we hear or maybe something someone says to us, a prayer that is prayed, a song that is sang. Change our hearts. Make us look more like you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We take a moment and just appreciate this worship team this morning. Welcome to Owensboro Christian Church. It is so good to see each of you here on campus. And if you're joining us on TV or online, we're glad that you have carved out part of your weekend to be with us, especially as we kick off the Christmas season here. There's a few things I want to mention about Christmas. There's something coming up this Thursday night. It's called Christmas City. And it's for three-year-olds through fifth grade. And it's a family event where you come and you'll walk through different countries around the world and see how they celebrate Christmas and some of their traditions. And so it's going to be a great uh, time with the kids this Thursday from 6 to 730. We do ask you to register for that event, if you would, please, just so we make sure we have enough stuff for everybody, crafts and different things. But you can do that on the app or through our website. But Christmas City this Thursday night. The second thing I want to mention is we have our photo booth out front there, and, and Jody's been out there taking pictures this morning, and so on your way out, if you want to grab one of those photos, it's out the door and to the right there. We'd love for you just to grab one of those on your way out. And then the third thing, no tickets this year for Christmas Eve, which is awesome. Yeah. And um, we have services at 2, 3.30, and 5, and would love for you to be a part of our Christmas Eve services this year. Grab your family, friends, invite them, come out. I will say that the 3.30 service is our biggest uh, service, so maybe the 2 and 5 maybe will work better for you. But in any case, come and celebrate with us on Christmas Eve. Well, we're in a new series called Hark. And it's just an incredible series that we just kicked off this weekend. So if you have your Bible or Bible app, I want to invite you to turn it this time. Well, good morning. Uh, before we hop into uh, today's message and really hop into the whole of our Christmas series, I want to take just a moment and say I, I hope that, that you know for me it's really important that I uh, communicate with you what I share with you, whether it's in a personal conversation or certainly what's in a sermon, that it's accurate. You know, it's important to me to be truthful and that way you can trust um, what I tell you is true. And then if we're looking at something in Scripture where people even have different, maybe, opinions, I might say, some people say this and some say this, and there are different ways to think about it. And then if I ever get something a little bit wrong, then I would go back and I would uh, correct myself and let you know. So just a couple weeks ago, I was talking about stewardship, talking about how we use what, what God has given us, and I, I shared, you know, somewhat pridefully, I mean, in a humorous way of pride, hopefully a healthy way of pride, but also kind of tongue-in-cheek, because I also meant it to be a little bit of a joke, I shared how uh, I drive a 2002 Honda, Honda CRV, and that uh, for the most part it, it works pretty well. It like the windows, automatic windows don't go down anymore, and uh, the auto locks don't work. You actually have to hit the unlock button on the key, and then you have to go and do it with the keychain, and like <laughs> you have to do both. CD player doesn't work, but as a whole, it still drives pretty well. I said it's 19 years old. I've been driving it for 14 years, and so I said just you know being good stewards of what God's given us. My goal was to drive it until uh, it was 21 years old and I'd had it for 16 years so that it could legally drink and also be old enough to drive itself. That was kind of my goal, um, to have it for 16 years. And I, that was really, I said, our, our, my full intention. Well, the, some news, I don't think we're actually, I'm not gonna get to that goal, it doesn't appear to be, and it's, it's not because the 
It's not because it broke down this week or anything like that, but I, I did want you to know that this summer, Sarah and I are expecting baby number two to come in this, this summer. So, yeah, so pretty, uh, pretty exciting. Uh, we're, we're, we're pumped about that, but, uh, you know, just as you think about having an older vehicle, probably gonna be in the market looking for something a little bit newer, maybe a little bit bigger, you know, and... Uh, gas like a van or something like that too I don't I don't know exactly what it will be so um, wanted just to communicate you the the, the baby coming any everything else in that message was was right and true okay I just so that just really was kind of a, a funny way to get into the announcement um, let's hop into Christmas I want you to imagine for a moment you're, you're hanging out at home you're relaxing uh, if you find this relaxing maybe you're washing the dishes and got some music on maybe you're watching TV maybe playing a game with your, your kids or your grandkids when all of a sudden an angel appears, pop, pops right up, begins to speak with you. What do you do? You may call your pastor, right? Like what in the world's going on here? Like there's an angel here at my house. Uh, may take your glasses off, if you wear glasses, <sighs> wipe them off and see. Make sure you're seeing clearly. If you're a person who scares easily, maybe you change your undergarments because there's been a bit of a, uh, a, a bit of an accident. Like, what, the angel appears. What, what do you do? Christmas is a time when angels start, start popping up everywhere. I don't know that they're really in, the, in our conscience um, most of the year, but you get to December, and all of a sudden there's angels on the tree, angels on your sweater, um, angels on the wrapping paper that are stuck over in the corner of the closet. You have angels on your TV. There's the famous line, uh, every time a bell rings and what? An angel gets its wings, that's right. Now I wanna give a, just a moment of pastoral confession and I please, you just applauded a minute ago for our baby news, please do not boo me at this point. I have never seen It's a Wonderful Life, if you can believe it. So yeah, one, <laughs> thanks, one boo. Um, I had one person last hour cheer who apparently was not a It's a Wonderful Life fan, but uh, never seen It's a Wonderful Life. Angels start appearing uh, everywhere this time of the year. Now. Surveys suggest that most people believe in angels. Um, a few years ago, the Associated Press conducted a poll found that 77% of Americans believe in angels, including half the people who say they don't believe in God, which I find to be a weird connection. Like, I don't believe in God, but I do believe in angels, but that's what the survey suggested. In 2016, Gallup ran a poll that found 73% um, believe in the paranormal, that was specifically uh, evil spirits, maybe malevolent angels, like, again, 75% of people said that they believed in angels. And then recently, this year, September of 2021, uh, Pew Research found that eight out of 10 people agree with the statement, things happen that cannot be explained by science or natural cause. So, so believing in angels, believing in the supernatural is a fairly common thing for people, even if they don't necessarily um, go to church or do so frequently. That said, how the supernatural world is portrayed culturally with how it's portrayed biblically um, are often at odds with one another. So you could believe in angels and still maybe um, miss it or not get it right, at least from a scriptural perspective. Put it to you this way, if you and I, or if you were to walk out to your, um, through your driveway to drop off the, the trash, and you were greeted by what we sometimes in culture project an angel to be, an angel greeted you along the way, and it was kind of a, one of those cherub little babies with um, a diaper on and the wings, like you, would, you probably wouldn't even bat an eye, right? You might, you might pull out your phone and take a picture, like that'd be kind of crazy, other than the fact that those cherubs sometimes have a man's face and a baby's body, like they're really not that, they're really not that scary, but when someone meets an angel in scripture, they typically fall over in fear. In fact, the, the angel's message often starts with the words, hey, don't be afraid, because the, the experience of meeting an angel, at least as it's portrayed in the Bible, is terrifying. I'll, I'll give you one example. An angel, when it announced the birth of Jesus to the shepherds, here's how the Bible describes the scene. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were, what's it say? They were terrified, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Well, what I wanna do over these next few weeks is I wanna look at the uh, announcement of Christmas, the Christmas story, the significance of Jesus' birth through uh, the message of the angels. And so we'll look at the, the message that the angel gave to Zechariah, the message that the angel gave to Mary, 
gave to Joseph, gave to the shepherds. Like, we're going to look at the Christmas story uh, through those messages. Today, what I want to do really to set the table for the whole month is I want to give you a, a brief survey of angels in the, the Bible. And I think it will be helpful because it will put us in the right frame of mind when we're looking at what the angels uh, the message that they brought to the people in the Christmas story and what the significance is for us now in, in 2021. And, and I'll confess, we cannot go through everything the Bible teaches about angels today. So I'm gonna use a very simple outline to set the stage. It's gonna be a three-point outline, and here it is. We're gonna look at an angel's job. We're gonna look at an angel's significance. And then we're gonna talk about an angel's loyalty. And having done those things, I think we'll be set up well for uh, the rest of the month as we talk about hark and we look, look at the announcement of Christmas. So let, let's start with number one, we'll hop into it. An angel's job is to announce God's message. The, the primary role of an angel is to be a messenger. That's just their job. And it's actually what the, the Greek word angelos, which is where we get the word angel, it's where it comes from. Los Angeles, the city of angels, angelos, that's, that's where we get the word angel, and the word literally means, the definition is a messenger. And so what you find in scripture are there are times when a messenger is sent and it's like the supernatural heavenly being, what we would call an angel, and there are times that an angel is sent, quote unquote angel, and it's a human messenger. Because all the word really means is it's someone who's delivering a message. Luke chapter seven, John the Baptist is in prison. He sends messengers to Jesus to ask Jesus a question because he can't go because he's locked up. And the Bible says, Luke seven, that John sends angels, but what it means is he sends his disciples to bring a message to Jesus. This is what the word means. Luke chapter nine, same thing. Jesus sends angels ahead of him into Samaria to, to share a message and to prepare some things for him, but they're, they're human messengers. They're just the disciples. Um, there are some people who even believe, book of Revelation, and right now, the second half of 2022, I hope to, uh, to preach through Revelation in the second half of 2022, but there are some people who believe that the the seven angels to the churches in Revelation may not be supernatural beings, but they're the messenger of those churches. So when Revelation says, hey, write to the angel of the church of Laodicea, write to the messenger of that church, it may be meaning, hey, write to the pastor, the messenger of the church, to share a message with the people. Here's what Jesus says. But my point is simply that the word angel means messenger. That's an angel's job. True, it's also true in the Old Testament, the word malach. Um, angel means a messenger, and so an angel's job is to communicate what God has commanded them to speak. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. They share God's message, and we'll get to that a little bit more in a moment, but at Christmas time, of course, that message is about the birth of God's son, Jesus, who's come to save the world. Number two, we'll spend a little bit more time on each of these uh, as we go through. Number two, an angel's significance is that God cares. If God desires to communicate with his creation, then it means he cares about what takes place in this world. He cares about what takes place in your life. If God didn't care, he wouldn't even bother to send a message. The fact that he sends a message, that he speaks this, that he wants to share it, means that he cares about what goes on with us. I'll give you kind of a crude example that took place um, to me just, just yesterday. Um, my normal Saturday routine is I'll come into the church about 12.30 or so, I'll eat some lunch with my family, and then uh, I'll come into the church, I'll go through my sermon a few times verbally, out loud, just kind of talk through it, and then I will check, um, I'll check the slides for the weekend for the screen um, with my notes, and so someone else puts in the slides for me during the week, and I'll go back, and if there's any changes, I'm gonna make some of those changes, and then if there's time, on a, on a good week, and I have time, I'll go home, I'll get a quick workout in, and then I'll, I'll shower, again on a good week I'll shower, and then I'll come back. Um, there, it's been pressed on time a few times and I've just you know sprayed something on and I came into church, but um, good week shower, come back and then preach the Saturday night service at 5.30. Well yesterday I wanted, to be a, I wanted to be a good husband, I wanted to be a good father and a good neighbor, and so we have one tree in our yard that holds on to its leaves for a long time and it had just released a, a bunch of the leaves and so it was a nice day, I went out and I was raking leaves in lieu of a workout. And so I'm out there and I'm raking real fast. It was a nice day. Leaves were dry. So it was actually happening really fast. Got a big pile, filled one huge uh, trash bag full of leaves and was working on the second trash bag when I, when I looked down and realized, I don't know if you noticed it or not yet, no ring. Like my wedding, my wedding ring was gone. So I 
called out my wife, I called out my, my son to come help. Ezra, of course, was a huge help. Here's a picture of us as we were wor working on it. He's, he's being super helpful. Um, and so what we'd started to do, Sarah and I, like we were taking uh, just like handfuls of leaves and mulching them in our hand and then dropping them in another bag, hoping that you'd find the ring, but you know it, it likely fell all the way down to the bottom or it's still laying on the ground, and, but as soon as you flip it over, it's gonna fall the other way. So we got through probably three inches of that bag in over, it took over an hour's you know, time and uh, I did not shower and I rushed into the church and I preached the, the 5.30 sermon. And because it's important to me, it just, it's just a ring, so I mean, you know, if, if you lose it, you lose it, and your marriage can still be strong. But what it symbolizes, and it's, I haven't lost it yet, so it's the original one, like, because it's important, I came to church, and I, I did something I normally don't do in the message. I, I shared, I've lost my wedding ring in a bag of, bag of leaves. Who of you have uh, a metal detector? And guess what? At the Saturday night service, we had three metal detectors that were available. And so the news for you is, if you ever need a metal detector, there are apparently a lot in this church, and you let us know, and we'll connect you with one. But I came and I shared that message because what I lost was, was important. If I had lost a, a 20, or if I had lost my keys or something and thought they would turn up, like, I don't know if I would have come and, and shared with the congregation, like, this is what I'm going through. But because it was important, I shared it. And the same thing is true with God. He shares the Christmas message with us. He, he sends a messenger because he again cares what's going on in the world. And there's a story in the Old Testament that to me really illustrates this truth, I think in as powerful way um, as anywhere else. And Kurt touched upon this a little bit last week, not this story, but this truth. Um, the story I'm talking about comes in Genesis chapter 16. And God has just told Abraham and Sarah they were gonna have a son, which was really big news because Abraham and Sarah were, the Bible puts it nicely, getting advanced in years. Um, they were nearing 100 years old and they had never been able to conceive, so Sarah was barren, and um, they said, you're gonna have a baby, and through this child, you're gonna have as many descendants as the stars in the sky, and through them, the whole world's gonna be blessed. Like, that was God's promise to them. But God makes that promise, and then nothing changes immediately. There's a few months that go by, there's still no baby, and so one day, Sarah says to her husband, um, you know what, how about you sleep with my servant, Hagar, and possibly through Hagar, God will give you a son, and that's how he will fulfill his promise. Um, it was not a good idea. Uh, Abraham should not have gone along with it. He went along with it. The Bible doesn't always tell us what people should do. It tells us what they did do. And so Abraham does sleep with Hagar. She conceives. And now, as you might imagine, there's, uh, there's significant friction in this household because Hagar has a, a measure of, of pride, perhaps, in her heart that she gave something to Abraham Sarah could not, so she feels... Um, kind of puffed up by that. Sarah looks with disdain upon her servant because she now has this intimate relationship with her husband. She gave something that she wasn't able to give herself. And so Sarah says, I want Hagar out of this house. And they end up throwing Hagar out of the house. Hagar is going through the desert, um, doesn't know what's gonna happen to her or her baby when God sends an angel. And the angel comes and says, listen, um, I don't want you to worry. I want you to stay strong. This may not be the son that God promised Abraham, but God's going to make a great nation out of your son, like everything's gonna be okay. And this was Hagar's response to the angel's message. It says, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. God sends a message to her, a messenger. She receives the message, and then she realizes through this, hey, God cares about what's going on in my life. So if you've ever wondered hey, whether someone sees you, and this is what Kurt talked about last week, the answer is yes. The, the most important, powerful being in the entire universe, he sees you, he loves you, he wants to communicate with you, blessed are those who mourn, like God God's with us even in those hard moments. He sees what's going on. And so I just want you to know, just as a pastor and a friend, and if I can make a, a brief application of this truth to, to your life, if a recent loss in your family, I, I had a funeral yesterday, Saturday morning, if a recent loss um, is gonna make the holidays really, really difficult, God sees you. If you are suffering right now abuse, at home, physical abuse, emotional abuse. First, 
you need to tell someone about that, what's happening, but I also want you to know God, God sees you. If you've been being bullied at school and you feel isolated and alone, and God sees you. If inflation is causing a headache for your family and you lost a job and you don't know if you're gonna even pay bills, let alone provide a Christmas, and you're just, you're stressed out about it all, like, God sees you. He sees, he cares, he wants to help out. In, in the Bible, angels are described as doing several things. They're described as ministering to Jesus. Um, they came to serve Jesus. They also described as ministering to God's people. Angels shut the mouths of lions for Daniel and the lion's den. Angels release the apostles from prison in the book of Acts. Uh, the book of Hebrews kind of summarizes all of this when it says, are not angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So an angel's primary job as a messenger is to communicate God's message, but the sheer fact that God sends a message means that he's not abandoned us. All right, he sees, he cares. That's really good news to hold on to this Christmas. And so um, angel's job and angel's significance. And then third, what I wanna spend the most time on is an angel's loyalty. And that loyalty is to God alone. There's a story in the book of Joshua that I've wanted to preach for a long time. I've never, never preached before, and I'm not gonna even, I'm not gonna count today as preaching it. So if I decide to preach it in six months, I don't want anyone telling me that I'm rehashing an old sermon, because we're just touching on it this morning. But, but the way the sermon, or the way the story goes, Joshua um, is preparing for battle. The nation of Israel is about to go into battle with the city of Jericho. Uh, this is the famous battle where the walls of Jericho come tumbling down but it's the night before the battle and Joshua goes out to kind of survey the land. And he's the leader of the army, so he's the successor to Moses. So he, he's doing a survey to get ready. He also probably has some nervous energy. It'd be like the, the coach before the big game and can't sleep very well. And so he's gone out to scout. And while he's out there, he, he sees a man holding a sword. At least he thinks it's a man. We find out later it's an angel. This is one of the few times in scripture that when someone sees an angel, they aren't terrified. Joshua, again, is preparing for battle, so he's got that adrenaline pumping, he's a tough guy. So he, he doesn't cower in fear, he actually shouts out, he's like, hey man, whose side are you on? He just thinks it's a soldier. He's like, are you on, are you on our side or are you on the enemy's side? And the answer he receives lets him know he's not talking to an ordinary person. So this is how Joshua chapter five puts it. I'm gonna read verses 13 through 15, and. And it's the longest passage I'm gonna read. This sermon's a little bit different because we're kind of surveying um, scripture rather than drawing a lot from one passage. But I do invite you to stand with me as I read this um, out of respect for God's word and looking at this is the longest passage I'm, I'm gonna read. Joshua 5, 13 says, Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up. He saw the man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? I love this answer. Uh, some translations just put it, say no. <laughs> Are you for us or our enemies? No. Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? He, he realizes he's speaking with an angel. An angel brings a message. So he's like, what, what message do you have? Verse 15, the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy, and Joshua did so. It's the word of the Lord, amen? amen. You may have a seat. Joshua discovers in this moment, he's standing on holy ground, he's not speaking to his soldier, he's not speaking to an ordinary man, he's speaking with an angel. Because he didn't understand it, he had said, hey, who are you, friend or foe? And I love the answer, neither. I think that's really telling for us because there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of discussion today, there's a lot of debate that goes back and forth in rhetoric about uh, whose side is God on? Like, God's on my side, God's with my tribe, God holds my views, like God's, God's with my party, like, guess what church, God's on his own side. God's on his own side. God's not, God's not partisan as you and I tend to be partisan. God is sovereign. So, so his holiness, his wisdom, his word is the standard, not our desires, not our practices, not, not our politics. Jesus, when he came to this earth, you know, Christmas we celebrate his coming, when he grew up and he began to preach a message, throwing them out, he taught us to pray, hey God, may your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in 
heaven. He recognized God as the true king. Now, I wanna, I wanna be clear. A person or a group or a church, like we can be closer to God's kingdom or we can be further away from it. So I don't intend to suggest that every, um, every belief, every worldview, uh, every perspective is created equal. But what I'm saying is we've grown way too confident in our own ability in our own wisdom if we think we've ever cornered the market on God's side. So that God um, is unequivocally on our, our side all of the time. No, friends, like God's always correcting us. He's always shaping us, always refining us. That's why when Joshua asked this angel, hey, whose side are you on? I think the response is important. I'm not on the enemy's side. I'm not on your side. This is the nation of Israel, right? Joshua leads the nation of Israel. So these are God's people. He goes, I'm not on your side. I'm on the side of the Lord. And then he says, hey, take off your sandals because the place where you're standing is holy. This is holy ground. And that's not the only time in scripture where someone is instructed to take off their sandals because the place where they're standing is holy. Can you think of another instance when that um, occurred? Who else was told that? Moses, Moses, yeah, was told when he was being spoke to from the burning bush, God said, hey, take off your sandals. You may not have recognized it to this moment, but the place where you're standing is holy. And, and I think uh, in sort of a symbolic gesture, that would be really important for us this Christmas, that, it, that if you and I have ears to hear, you know, so to speak, if our hearts open, um, taking off our sandals, our shoes, whether whether metaphorically, symbolically, or literally taking off our shoes can help put Christmas and the entire ministry of Jesus in perspective. Right? Christmas, is, Christmas is holy ground. God sent a messenger to tell a message. And it's not about Jesus. It's not about Jesus didn't come to earth to live and die because we're on God's side. And God wanted to know we're on his side. Now, Jesus came so that we could, could be on God's side. We were apart from God, we were separated from him, we need Jesus to do something about it. Like Christmas, Christmas is holy ground. This is God bringing the message that the whole world needs. And it's not, it's not semantics, it's not a word game to say, hey, God's on our side, we're on God's side. No, like to say that God is on our side puts us at the center of reality. And it suggests that all of history and all of what's going on in the world and all of, like everything revolves around us when in reality, God's the one who's at the center. And history and life and ethics and relationships, it all revolves around God and who God, God is. Fr Francis Schaeffer wrote at, at length about this. Francis Schaeffer's not read a whole lot anymore. He passed away um, a while ago. But many of you may remember reading him the last, um, in, the, in the 70s and 80s and even a bit in the 90s. And, and he wrote a great deal about how people had through the centuries pushed God out of the center and replaced God with themselves. And he said, we see this in every area of life. It's not like one area of life does this. He goes, but you often see it first in the arts um, because artists have a really great ability because of their creative expression either to open up new worlds or to give voice to what's kind of happening already in the dominant culture and they're the ones that are able to express it. So it's not that the arts are causing this, but they're able to give voice to it. And he said what happened through the centuries is that God got moved out of the center of reality and replaced with, with people. And what happens when humanity loses its center, it loses its meaning. Now, a visual, I think, could be helpful with this. Here's the visual. When God is at the center, there is always an absolute that you can return to time and time again. Now, you know as well as I do, trusting in God, having him at the center of your life does not mean um, that you're never gonna have pain, doesn't mean that it solves all of your problems immediately. What it means is if you trust in the Lord, you always have a, a place to come back to. You always have something to ground yourself in when the problems come. Um, faith gives you a foundation for, for ethics, a foundation for meaning. There's something external to you that roots your life. But when you take God out of the center, all you're left with is yourself. And what that means is you have to drum up everything in life from your own being. Like all security, all stability, all morality has to be extracted from yourself. There's no external standard that you can turn to. You have to create it. So you really get to shape your own reality. You get to shape your own destiny. And I think that's one reason there are a lot of people who are drawn to this 
you know, this type of life? Because it sounds really liberating. I, I can create for myself whatever I want life to, to look like. But what happens ultimately is this proves to be unsustainable. It proves to be unsustainable. It proves to be destructive. Schaefer put it this way. He said, humanism, which is really just a way of saying you put human beings at the center. Humanism has found no way to arrive at universals or absolutes which give meaning to existence and morals. When the particulars gradually and increasingly become everything, it devours all meaning until meaning disappears. So it's never just a question whether, whether God's on our side, as if we get to choose our side and then make God coalesce to it. Now the question is, like, are we on God's side? Are we recognizing him at the center of all things, the Christmas story at the center, really, of, of what life is all about? And, and I find it really telling that when Joshua gets to the end of the book and he's got a message for the nation of Israel, he's got that famous speech where he says, hey, choose this day who you're going to serve. He says, as for me and my house, he goes, we will serve the Lord. Almost as if Joshua had learned from his experience with this angel, hey, hey like, you gotta decide to be on God's side because that's what's really important. And in the same way, the manner Christmas is announced through the angels tells us everything that we need to know. Right, Christmas is God's holiday, it's not ours. It's God's message, it's God's purpose. So, so we're really standing on holy ground when we come to this month. And I'm gonna encourage you this Christmas, this December, Again, whether it's symbolic for you or whether you just literally sometimes need to do it to remind yourself, take, take off your shoes. Recognize the significance of the fact that God came to earth and what it means. Like, Christmas is God's story and it, it's, it's truly holy ground. And so in, in light of that, and in light of looking at these three parts of the angels, an angel's message, um, an angel's significance, and then an angel's loyalty to God alone, I'm gonna give you just three quick action items that we can take from this, we can apply to our life, and then I'll close this. And this will be very, very quick. And I think it sets us up for where we're headed all month. Number one is this, the Christmas story is meant to be shared. All right, just as the angels came to Ze Zechariah and gave a message to Mary, to Joseph, to the shepherds, like we have a message to share with other people and the arrival of Jesus. Like Christmas story was meant to be shared. Uh, there, was a, there was a famous individual from a few centuries ago that many of you will have heard of named St. Fran Francis of Assisi. He was a wonderful man. He did a lot of work with the poor, um, a man of great integrity. So I, I, don't, I don't really want to say anything um, bad about him this morning. But he was attributed to the saying that um, when preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Maybe you, some of you have heard that. Preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. We're not sure that Francis ever actually said this. It's attributed to him. We don't know if he did say it. Um, if he did say it, despite what a wonderful man he was, um, the saying itself is hogwash. And what I mean is this. The gospel must come with actions. That's true. We have to show people in our love and our care and our generosity, our hospitality, that we believe Jesus is real and that he loves all people, like he's got a message for all people. That, the Bible tells us this, James chapter one, don't just be hearers of the word, be doers of the word. So we have to put our faith into action, that part's right. But without putting the message into words, no one will ever figure it out that God cared so much for you and so much for this world that he entered into it himself as a baby and he gave up his own son to save us. You can show people you love them all day, and I hope that you do, through your actions, through how you care for them, but until you tell them why you love them, or even more importantly, why God loves them, you haven't shared the gospel with them. So, so put actions to your words, yes, but the Christmas message came 2,000 years ago through words. It, it was a message, and it still needs to be a message today. And so God's put someone in your life. I don't know who it is. I don't know how well you know him. He's, he's put someone in your life who needs to hear the message of Christmas. Because number two, the Christmas story is the only message that brings true hope. All right, where people are gonna spend millions or billions of dollars this month trying to some way buy peace, trying to some way buy hope. It only comes through Christmas that God sees, God cares. He entered the world to do something about our problem. And so we need to share the message. It's the only one that brings true hope. And then number three, third action point, the Christmas story is not ours to tamper with. Right, we cannot change the method by which Jesus came. We can't change the message that he preached. We can't change the morality by which he lived. 
we, we can't change the meaning of his life, death, and resurrection. Christmas is God's holiday, not ours. And so we truly are standing on holy ground. And so this Christmas, um, you know, my prayer for you, my prayer for our church, is that we, we would humble ourselves before the God who humbled himself to enter into this world and save us. And, and whatever that means for you, maybe there's a reconnection that you need to have with the Lord. Um, maybe there's a way that, that you need to, to serve someone else in the name of Jesus. Uh, maybe there's something in your family, some values that you kind of want to or, or redirect and kind of recenter on, on Christ this holiday. But I pray for all of us that we recognize the holiness of this moment. All right, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for sending your son. It was certainly not something that you have to do. It was something that you did because of your love for us, because of your love for this world. You sent a messenger. They delivered a message of hope and peace. And Lord, uh, they had no authority to change that message to their liking, and, and neither do we. And so, God, I pray we would receive Jesus as you intend us to receive him this Christmas season. I pray that we would see the significance of the baby born in a manger, of his life and of his death. And we would. We would remove our sandals. We would bow our heads. We would humble our hearts before the creator of the world who entered into the creation to rescue us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. I want to invite you to stand uh, with me for a time of response. Uh, this morning, if, uh, you know, if you have something on your heart you want to bring before God, you want to bring it to the altar and just say, God, um, could you be with me, be with my family? We're going through some things. Um, please let us know that you see us. Maybe you want to come pray. If you want to give God thanks for something, if you want to pray for someone you know who's suffering, like the front will be open and I'll be here praying myself. So if you come, you're not going to be alone. We're going to use this time to respond in prayer. We're going to respond in song. You can, you can pray silently from where you're standing as well. You can sing out to God. We'll take the Lord's Supper together and then we'll close. But uh, let's not rush through this time. Uh, would you respond as God puts on your, on your heart?
holy ground that uh, was uh, evident at the manger, uh, in some ways was the same holy ground that was there. When Jesus went to Golgotha and he gave his life on the cross and, and the whole purpose for his coming uh, came to fruition when he gave his life and then, uh, and then he defeated death. He rose from the grave and he defeated death. Like there's nothing in this life that can take away the promises and love that God has for us, his children. And so um, if you've trusted in Jesus as uh, the son of God who came to take away the sins of this world and your sin. Now let's take the bread and break and eat and remember Jesus had a body. He came as a baby and he gave his life. Let's take the bread and eat. Let's take the juice and drink and remember Jesus' blood um, shed for the forgiveness of sin. You can go ahead and remain standing. I just, uh, a few quick things before we go. If you need prayer after the service, I'll be down front um, along with uh, you know, another pastor or two and we'd love to pray for you and help you any way that we can just have a conversation about whatever's going on in life. And um, if you're new to OCC, you got some questions about um, what takes place for different ages or maybe the, the event on Thursday Tom talked about or Christmas Eve, we have something, we have a welcome center right out here by entrance B. There'll be some people there who would love to answer your questions, just get to know you a little bit too. And so please take us up on that. We would love to meet you. And um, for everyone else, I'm just going to pray a blessing over us that this week we could share um, a little bit of the hope of Christmas and peace of Christmas with somebody else in our life. And then uh, you can pray too that this afternoon um, that, that metal detector will find my wedding ring because I don't want I don't want to spend all afternoon doing that uh, looking for it. So I got three metal detectors coming at one o'clock. So that'll be great. Um, God, thank you so much for being able uh, to be here today. Uh, there are times that we've probably taken for granted being able to gather together. Um, help us not to take that for granted. It's, uh, it's even a holy moment to be able to come together uh, and open up your word and sing songs to you and receive from you. Help us take what we receive. Help us share it with others. Help us recognize the holiness of this moment and this Christmas the whole month long. And may we share it with somebody else. We pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next weekend.